Good afternoon, and thanks very much for joining us. My name is Kathy Buscalia. I'm Howard Center's Director of Innovation and Special Projects, and one of the project leads for our new mental health urgent care. We are thrilled to be opening this new program on October 28th in partnership with the University of Vermont Medical Center, Community Health Centers, and Recording Pathways in progress. Vermont. It has been a wonderful collaboration and we are looking forward to offering this new service to our community. In just a few minutes, you'll be hearing from today's presenters. Maureen Leahy, Administrative Director of Psychiatry at UVM Medical Center, and Charlotte McCorkle, Senior Director of Client Services at Howard Center. I also want to acknowledge and thank Jennifer and Lucia, our American Sign Language interpreters, who will be signing throughout the session. Now I'd like to review our format for today's webinar. During the webinar, your audio, video, and chat functions will not be available. You can turn captioning on and off on your Zoom toolbar. If you have any technical issues during the webinar, you may send your issue through the Q&A and we'll do our best to provide support. After the presentation, our panelists will take questions, which may be sent through the Q&A at any time throughout the session. And you may ask your questions anonymously. We are recording today's webinar and it will be posted in the next few days on our website at howardcenter.org. I also want to acknowledge and thank our partners here with us today. Dr. Rob Altoff, Chair of Psychiatry at the University of Vermont Health Network. Dr. Jeff McKee, CEO of Community Health Centers. Lindsay Mesa, Assistant Director of Pathways Vermont. Katie Borg, Director of Services at Pathways Vermont, who will be joining us for the Q&A. And my colleague and Howard Center's CEO, Sandy McGuire. Karen Vastine, Senior Community Relations Officer for the University of Vermont Health Network, and a co-lead on this project is also here and will be moderating the Q&A for us. Welcome all. And now before our presentation begins, Dr. McKee is going to make a few remarks on behalf of the partners. Thank you for being here, Dr. McKee. Thanks, Kathy. So, you know, uh, as the CEO of uh, the Community Health Centers, here in uh, in Burlington. It's been my pleasure to, to be a part of a lot of collaborative conversations and across 25 years of leading healthcare and mental health programming in Vermont, we've seen a lot of uh, very innovative work that's been done across the state to bring services to meet community needs. The conversations that have happened around this program here for mental health urgent care are truly exceptional, exceptional, even with all of that uh, history here that we have here in Vermont. This program is unlike any other mental health urgent care program that I've been familiar with, insofar as it brings together uh, hospitals, uh, the community mental health center, the community health center, and peer and support services as true collaborative partners. And uh, that is uh, really unique to Vermont and very unique to, um, I think, this work that we've done together. It started as a conversation almost two years ago, I think, uh, when we started having the conversation about this need. Um, and along that way, uh, all of the partners have been uh, truly at the table, sharing staffing, sharing financial resources, and sharing kind of a, a personal, personal and uh, organizational commitments uh, to uh, providing this level of care for our community. So uh, the Community Health Centers is truly very proud to, uh, to be a part of this unique program 
and uh, exceptionally grateful to uh, the folks at the Howard Center and UVM Health Network for, uh, uh, for taking the lead uh, and including us in the programming along with other partners. Um, so just wanted to call attention to the uniqueness and the uh, truly uh, collaborative approach that we're all taking uh, to uh, provide the solo care. And, and I'm glad to turn it back over to, to Charlotte and Maureen. Thanks, Dr. McKee. <clears throat> um, so Charlotte and I would like to welcome you to this discussion. And we're going to give you a little bit of information to digest. Um, certainly, um, as mentioned before, ask the questions of us that you have. Uh, so I'd like to take us back a couple of years to the genesis of this uh, program. So back in the summer, of, first of all, I'd like to call out that we know the incidence of mental health needs in the population nationally. We know that 25% um, of adults have uh, a mental health need. And we have been able to replicate this percentage number locally. So um, we know that that within Vermont and our region, uh, we see this we, we see this incidence, uh, if not more, in our population. Somewhere around the summer of 22, uh, we saw the numbers in our emergency department of patients waiting for inpatient psychiatric beds to climb. On average, that summer, we had 11 plus adults waiting for a bed somewhere in the system and one to two children waiting for a bed somewhere in the system. These numbers swing considerably uh, depending on closures of inpatient beds and opening of inpatient beds. So if, an, if a partner hospital somewhere closes 10 inpatient psychiatric beds, we see these numbers in the emergency room climb. Uh, it's very much uh, a system of care that is dependent on all of the participants. We had several days that summer with uh, more than 20 people waiting for inpatient beds. <clears throat> the same summer, uh, we pulled together the partners involved in this program, plus the Department of Mental Health, uh, UVM Medical Center, Howard Center, Community Health Centers, and Pathways Vermont. And the two things that we really landed on were, first of all, uh, the ED is just not the right place for care for this population of patients. This is not to say that our teams in the emergency department are not providing excellent care and are not heroes in the care that they provide. However, the emergency department as a therapeutic setting for people experiencing mental health needs um, is just not, uh, not the case. The second thing we agreed on was we needed to come together uh, as a collaboration and address the problem. This was not something that UVM Medical Center could solve. This was not something that Howard or CHC or Pathways could solve any one of us on our own. However, in coming together and pooling our resources and our thought power, uh, we felt that we could come up with a solution to address the problem. Late in 2022, the Department of Mental Health issued a request for proposal for alternatives to the emergency department. So this was a really important confluence of events um, in an effort to provide a therapeutic alternative for patients experiencing mental health crisis. Through this request for proposal, we were awarded a grant to get this work started. This slide is a graphic that we borrowed from um, a colleague and partner at the State Department of Mental Health that shows the options for crisis services for Vermonters. While there is an arrow that goes from one resource to the next to the next, you do not have to access crisis services linearly at, like this. You can access crisis services at any point um, along this uh, graphic. So uh, the, one of the options for uh, Vermonters in mental health crisis is the 988 lifeline. And as you can see by the graphic, 95% of calls are resolved by phone. There's also mobile crisis in Chittenden County that is first call uh, through the Howard Center. 
um, for any callers or uh, webinar participants that are from other counties, um, it's a different service, but they provide the same um, level of care. And 81% of those um, uh, incidents are resolved in the community. What we're adding through the mental health urgent care in Chittenden County is an alternative to the emergency department. And as you can see by the arrows, um, the idea is to have um, a, a, as have, have people have access to services at the least restrictive level that's appropriate. Some people will be able to be served by 988, some people will need mobile crisis, and some people will need the mental health urgent care. The mental health urgent care is one of, it's okay, thanks. The mental health urgent care is one of four programs currently in Vermont. Um, all are variations of the idea of an alternative to the emergency department. And one of the things we genuinely hope through the next few years as that is that we learn what is best practice for our communities in Vermont. As you can imagine, bringing together four community partners in this manner um, has proven its own body of work uh, on its own. And one of the things that we have done to help guide our work is early on, we developed a value statement, which I'll read to you. The mental health urgent care will provide accessible, timely, trauma-informed care that is person-centered, equitable, and coordinated to meet the needs of each guest. When we have had conflicting opinions, when we have been trying to determine the best flow for the work we're doing, this has often been a guiding post for us. And at this point, I'll hand off to my colleague, Charlotte. Thank you, Maureen, for that background information. And I'm very excited to tell you some specifics about the Mental Health Urgent Care Program. The population that the program will serve is adults experiencing any sort of self-defined mental health crisis. So that may not be what is a mental health crisis to me, but if it's a crisis to the person experiencing some distress, we are very happy to serve them. And our hope in having this philosophy is that people might access support or services before they would have otherwise gone to the emergency department. For adults who are um, not needing life-threatening uh, medical attention or um, clear that inpatient psychiatric hospitalization is the only response. We're hoping that those adults will come to this program to access a number of different services, all of which are voluntary. The services specifically will be mental health crisis assessment and case management, safety planning, some medical care provided by a registered nurse or through a telehealth appointment with a medical provider, including assistance with medications, peer support services, and engagement. And we're really excited that the location for our mental health urgent care program will be at 1 South Prospect Street. We believe this location is both accessible and also destigmatizing in that people come to this location for many different types of services. As Maureen mentioned, we were awarded a grant from the Department of Mental Health that is funding about 10% of the program in the first year. And the rest of the funds are from UVM Medical Center operational funds as directed by the Green Mountain Care Board. And our pro projected start date is October 28th, which is coming right up, but we are on target and schedule to open our doors to the public that day. So a few details that we wanna share. Um, as Maureen mentioned, this is a new program for our community. There's no other mental health urgent care in Chittenden County. But there are other programs in Vermont and there are other programs across the country. And we've done some research about different models and also visited programs so that we're not reinventing the wheel, but looking at best practices and learning about what works so that we can implement that here. To start, the hours of operation for the program will be Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. In an ideal world, we might have a seven day a week program or a 24 seven program but we do have staffing challenges across our partner agencies and in our community. And we wanted to be able to stand this up and staff it with efficacy so that we could provide the services we could in the hours that were open. And we're confident we can do that to start 
Monday through Friday, nine to five. In the future, we might look to expand hours into the evenings or possibly on weekends. When um, someone arrives at One South Prospect, there will be a number of signs helping them to arrive to mental health urgent care, which will be in the Arnold 4 section of the building. And this is a walk-in clinic, so people don't need an appointment or a referral to receive services. They can simply come and show up and they will be offered the array of services I mentioned earlier and get the care that they need. People will also be able to come back the next day or following their initial service to receive follow-up care. So different from a traditional physical health urgent care, it's not just a single point of access for same day services. We will be offering follow-up services knowing that for many people, their crisis isn't easily resolved, but may need additional safety planning, additional peer support, ongoing medical care, and case management to help symptoms alleviate or to help connect to other services in our community. And we'll have navigators as part of our staff to help people find their way through the program and to help maintain a calm, trauma-informed environment. And so specifically, Howard Center will be offering mental health support services through crisis assessment, some brief intervention and safety planning. Pathways will be offering peer support, including in a beautiful community room that has a view of Lake Champlain. Howard Center will also be offering case management, as I mentioned, and then community health centers will be offering medical assessment and care. Um, again, by a registered nurse on site and then a medical provider through telehealth. And there will also be access to same day or next day in-person appointments at the Riverside location for community health centers. The staff for this program will be about 18 in total. There will be three master's level crisis clinician, two peer support specialists, two care managers, one registered nurse, one navigator, and then a team of supervisors, and again, telehealth consultation. At this point in our process, we're more than 50% staffed, and we're very confident we'll have solid staffing for October 28th when the program opens. I also want to mention that these are new positions thanks to the funding we've received, so we're not pulling from other positions um, from other programs. Other programs in our own agency and partner agencies are remaining fully operational, and this is an expanded capacity for our crisis services and care in general. There's a lot of curiosity about who this program can serve and who it can't serve. And we're really hoping to serve as many people as possible at any point in their self-defined crisis or when they're needing support. People with multiple diagnoses or multiple needs, inclu including complex needs, are welcome to come to the program. Our staff will be trained in suicide care. And for people experiencing a suicide crisis, we want them to come to this program to receive a number of different types of supports and interventions. People with co-occurring medical conditions or substance use are absolutely welcome in this program, in addition to people looking for peer support. And there's no criteria or mandate that anyone accessing the program needs to have a certain baseline set of services. If someone wants to come to the program and access peer support as their um, sole focus for their visit, that's absolutely welcome. If someone wants to talk to a case manager, but that's the only service they want that day, that's absolutely fine. We really want this to be guided by a participant's a voice and choice for the services that may help them in that moment. If someone is um, experiencing acute or very serious medical needs like stroke or heart attack symptoms, we would direct them to the emergency department for emergency level of care. If someone is using substances such that they're incapacitated, that they can't manage their own body or take care of themselves, we would redirect them to the emergency room or to a different level of care. The goal for this program is for someone who's coming under their own steam or own power, who's looking for care or support or some sort of intervention. They may not know what it looks like in that point of care or when they walk in the door, but we can help explain the services that are offered and see 
um, what they would like to engage in. So they may not know what they're looking for, but the goal is that people are coming um, under their own volition because they're, they're wanting help. If someone does need inpatient psychiatric treatment, they do need to go to the emergency department to access that level of care. That could be decided by a provider instead of accessing mental health urgent care, or if someone comes to the program and um, is in a suicide crisis or another sort of psychiatric crisis such that inpatient mental health care is what they're wanting, we would help them get to the emergency department and do that warm handoff so that referrals can be made and care can be received at the appropriate level. And then there's a lot of curiosity about ambulances coming to mental health urgent care. And maybe one day down the road, we'll be able to have an ambulance bay and receive um, ambulances. But at least to start, ambulances must go to the emergency department as well, as is what happens now. It can be that if someone goes to the emergency department and gets treatments there, part of their discharge plan may be that the next time they're experiencing that set of symptoms, let's say about anxiety, again, about suicide, that part of their discharge plan is that they access mental health urgent care instead of the emergency department. But the ER is not allowed to turn people away um, once someone comes in the doors. And then there's also curiosity about um, whether people can spend the night in this program, and it's not a bed-based program. So based on the rooms we have, including a community room, a low stimulation sensory room, consultation rooms, and exa an exam room, we can actively serve eight to 10 people at a time, in addition to family members or natural supports who may accompany someone to the program. Additionally, our beautiful waiting room can hold about 15 people at a time. And again, if people need more support, they can come back the next day. So Howard Center will oversee the program and manage the operation, operational and clinical programming. Community health centers will provide the on-site nursing, telehealth, and follow-up medical care. Pathways Vermont will be providing the peer support services. And University of Vermont Medical Center is providing the space, program funding, and other operational supports. As Maureen mentioned, there are a number of programs in Vermont. This will be the fourth mental health urgent care. Again, all are a slightly different model and this um, mental health urgent care will have the medical support, peer support and mental health support, which makes it a bit unique in Vermont. And so with that, we will open it up to questions. We'd love to hear from you and um, answer any questions you have about the program or the model. Okay, um, thank you so much, Charlotte and Maureen for walking us through that. Um, we do have a lot of questions in our Q&A and I also just wanna say welcome to our 266 participants in this conversation. So we figured there would be a lot of interest in this topic. So um, many of you asked more than one question. And so what I'm gonna do is just kind of go through these one at a time for now, and then I may come back um, if you ask multiple questions, and I may come back to, um, uh, you know, ones that we didn't get to if we run out of questions, but I have a feeling we won't. Um, so the first question, and I think this can go to you, Charlotte, is regarding what happens after three years? A lot of people have asked this question. We've made it clear that we're funded for three years. So what then? Thanks, Karen. I thought you were going to say what happens after five o'clock, which is also a frequently asked question, and I'm happy to answer both. So we have full sustainable funding for three years. We feel very lucky and fortunate for that. Because of the funding, uh, we will not be charging guests. We will not be billing insurance, with the exception of some medical services provided by community health centers. So in that way, it's a one-of-a-kind service in our community. During those three years, though, we will be collecting insurance information so that we can start to gather data and information about what billing would look like after three years so that we can make a plan for sustainability and see what medical or health insurance would cover and then what the gap would be that we might have to fund in other ways. So we're planning for this program to exist way beyond three years and for it to have sustainable funding beyond that, and we're gonna collect data and look at sustainability models to help ensure that. 
Thankfully, that three-year window gives us ample time to do so. I will answer the question, what happens at five o'clock? So there's certainly concern because someone's crisis or needs don't end at 5 p.m. But when someone walks through the doors at mental health urgent care, we'll be talking about their needs, what's going on for them, and discharge planning right from that moment of entry. So throughout the course of the day, people will be coming and going from the program and we'll be working with our guests and also community partners to help make a plan for that person so that they have some stability overnight and can come back the next day if that's needed, or they can connect to other resources in our community, including Pathways New Peer Respite Program opening this fall, Howard Center's Adult Crisis Stabilization Program, which has six beds, or other programs to help meet people's needs. Thank you, Charlotte. Um, so that was a bonus. Um, thank you. So Maureen, this next question is for you. Um, a, a number of people have asked what happens if somebody's uh, needs exceed those of the program? So we have broken that down into to two sort of categories. One is if their mental health needs exceed the need of the program. And one is if their medical needs exceed the need of the program. Um, as we broke that down, we realized the response is pretty much the same. Um, if somebody is in acute need uh, for emergency services, they're having a heart attack, they're having a stroke, we're concerned about their life right now, we would activate 911 in the same way that we would activate 911 for an ambulance transfer if something were happening in one of the other clinics in the building. If somebody's needs are more than um, the mental health urgent care can manage, but do not require 911 transfer, we would work with the individual to get them to the right resource. And the right resource may be the emergency department. It may also be a different program of services. If the patient, excuse me, the guest is able to um, get to the emergency department on their own and feels comfortable with that, that will be embraced. If we need to use one of the staff members to help them get there, either by walking a couple of blocks up the hill or by vehicle, uh, we will do that as well. Okay. I just want to add that we'll have the ability for consultation by phone yes. with partners in the emergency department to help make some of those decisions so that if someone does need to go from mental health urgent care to the emergency department, it's coordinated and there's a warm handoff. Our goal is to be able to manage as many of the patients as guests, I'll get that right, as many of the guests that walk through the doors um, as is appropriate. If somebody needs a higher level of care, we'll help them get that. Okay, great. Thank you. I believe I can answer this next question, which is actually about um, whether or not we will have promotional materials that we can um, send out that others can spread about the service. And the short answer is yes. And the longer answer is stay tuned. We are still developing rack cards and that kind of thing. But even currently, we do have um, a, an FAQ document as well as just some basic information um, about the clinic. So um, we will figure out how to share that and get back in touch with you. But Kathy, if you have anything you want me to add to that answer, let me know. Um, so the next question, um, let me just see if I can summarize this. Um, this person is appreciating the innovation, collaborative and resources sharing um, approach to community needs. Um, but we all know that our system lacks the capacity and funding to serve the actual level of mental health needs um, of Vermonters. Uh, when you find when you find yourself in need, you know this all too well. What will it take for our leaders to tell what will what will it take to hear our leaders tell Congress that we need to open our federal purse to provide adequate funds for our mental health care? Um, Dr. Altoff, do you want to take that one? I thought that one might come to me, Karen. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank thank you for the question. You're 100 percent correct that um, in in general, and it's not just Vermont, of course, it's across the country. Uh, services are underfunded. Um, I don't want anybody to misinterpret the fact that we're trying to do things here to to mean we're not doing the other things. We we are doing the other things. And we're advocating um, really as strongly as we can um, at at other sites. 
um, for for increased federal funding, for increased state funding, for that matter, for the services that that uh, that Vermonters and especially those in this particular program in Chittenden County need. So um, so we're still doing that that piece, uh, and uh, I I welcome uh, other folks to chime in on that a, as well um, in, in terms of writing to to your uh, Congress person and uh, to your senators and and advocating for this because you're 100 percent correct. Uh, we are we are underfunded, and um, and we we can use the support. Thank you, Dr. Altaf. Um, while you're there, could I get you back on the screen? Um, we uh, we got another question. It was actually about the funding and the confidence that the funding that we're providing will be there for the mental health urgent care. Would you mind taking that one as well? Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to. I. I, I think the Charlotte is correct that uh, three years is going to give us a really good idea of the the size and scope and um, and and the overall cost uh, and gives us the opportunity to look at both conventional uh, billing models but also maybe some unique billing models for a program like this. We've been successful in other uh, areas of finding uh, sort of unique partners in in uh, in funding and and billing. Um, in order to make things sustainable that otherwise wouldn't have been thought to be sustainable. And I think especially there's a strength in the partnership um, uh, among this the, these groups to make that happen. So, um, yeah, it, you know, it, it looks like, OK, it's only three years of funding, but at the same time, it's three years of us to really work on the funding piece. And, and that's uh, in, in, you know, actually, it's a it's a longer time than it seems like because of how quickly things change in the funding environment. Um, the the concern I have is that we want to change this multiple times and how we how we get it funded in that time period. But uh, I I think we will we'll work together to get that done. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm going to let you off the hook now, Dr. Altaf. So um uh so Maureen or Charlotte, I think either one of you can answer the next couple of questions. Um, does the mental health urgent care serve children and youth? Is that for you, Charlotte? I'm happy to take that one. Okay. Um, in our um, community, we have other crisis programs and other youth-focused programs to um, respond to children and youth. So this program is designed for people 18 and over. That being said, it is a kid-friendly program. If a parent or caregiver is needing to access the services of the program but comes with their young family, their children or infant, there will, it will absolutely be a kid-friendly environment and we can provide family-focused care. But if a child or youth is needing crisis support, they should access First Call for Chittenden County, the mobile crisis response through Howard Center, talk to the school counselor or child care resource, or talk to the pediatrician. Thank you. Um, for either one of you, uh, why isn't the mental health urgent care open 24-7 like an emergency department? That's a great question. If I had a magic wand, we would have our services open 24 seven without a doubt. And our whole work group really believes that. In fact, our initial proposal was expanded services from what we have now, but we have a real workforce challenge in our community. Howard Center has about a 20% vacancy rate. We have hundreds of positions posted and we don't have enough people to fill those positions in our community. So we couldn't create a 24 seven program without the confidence and assurance that we would be able to staff it. And we knew based on the programs we have that are 24 seven that are struggling with staffing and a number of nonprofits and social services that have had to close due to staffing that we would not be able to sustain a 24 seven model. So for the initial period of time of this program opening, it will be Monday through Friday, nine to five. But if we can um, solve for some of our workforce challenges, attract more people to Vermont, have more training programs and other investments, our hope is that we would have the right staff to be able to expand. The limited Monday through Friday, nine to five is not about the lack of need, nor is it about funding. It's really about not having enough staff to hire to be able to provide services for that amount of time. Okay, thank you. Um, and then um, we do have a lot of questions about what happens at 5 p.m. So hopefully we've addressed those um, at this point. Um, uh, but I am also seeing questions about um, whether or not guests 
insurance will be billed. Can you, either one of you comment on that, please? I'm happy to. So the funding we have for three years means that we do not have to bill medical insurance or health insurance for any of the guests for peer support or mental health support, with the exception of some medical services that community health centers provides that will be billed to a guest's medical insurance. So if someone comes in for a crisis assessment or case management and then receives follow-up care, accesses peer support, they will not be uh, charged for those services and their health insurance will not be billed. If a medical service is provided that will need to be billed, that will be explained to the guest before the service is provided so that they can understand what the um, charge to the health insurance will be and what any co-pays or bill would look like from that. Thank you. Maureen, are any UVM Medical Center staff gonna work in this department? No, this is a fully um, Howard Center CHC Pathways staffed program. There will be no UVM Medical Center staff providing cl uh, clinical services, administrative services, or any other kinds of services for the program. Um, Charlotte or another colleague from Howard, if one of you wants to weigh in. Um, uh, when would you refer somebody to the mental health urgent care as opposed to first call and vice versa? That's a great question. So first call for Chittenden County is um, Howard Center's 24-7 crisis response team. And that service is not changing because of mental health urgent care. So first call has its name for a reason. If someone's not sure what to do in crisis, they should absolutely call first call first. A um, trained clinician, a crisis clinician, will answer that call and will help the caller, whether it's the person in need of support themselves, a family member, a provider, or someone else who's concerned. They'll talk through what the concern is and what options may be to address that concern. One of those options may be phone support that helps to make a plan and alleviate the immediate crisis. First Call can also provide a mobile response anywhere in Chittenden County that will include a crisis clinician and a peer support specialist who can co-respond to someone's home or another location in our community to provide a crisis assessment and plan. But if someone doesn't want that mobile response to their home or First Call is not available in that moment, between the hours of nine to five, Monday through Friday, someone can absolutely be directed by first call or suggested that they access the mental health urgent care program. That being said, someone doesn't have to call first call first. So if someone knows about mental health urgent care and wants to access that service, they're absolutely welcome to just show up physically in person and we will welcome them and receive them. So first call is not a prerequisite for accessing the program. Okay, thank you. And I think this was in response to an earlier question about um, the ages of uh, guests um, for this program. And the question is, why no adolescents and do we plan to include them? That's a great question. So the way our services are set up in Chittenden County mirrors Vermont and actually the country in that there are some services for people who are under 18, who are considered minors legally, and then people who are 18 and over. So sometimes we think about adolescents and young adults. There are 18 and 19 year olds who I would probably define as adolescents in some way. 18 and 19 year olds, young adults can absolutely access the program. We're hoping that our college student population, not only at UVM, but in other neighboring institutes of higher education will promote mental health urgent care and that students will access it. But for people under the age of 18, there are specific youth services through Howard Center, through NFI, through Spectrum, and a number of other community partners who are well poised to provide services to that population and to their families and to connect to other supports. Great. Thank you. I always appreciate those answers about developmentally appropriate care. So thank you. It's a good question because obviously it's also a need that we have in our area as well. Maureen, I have a question for you. Um, uh, will law enforcement be able to drop off individuals at the urgent care? So we had a great meeting with um, police chiefs, fire chiefs, ambulance chiefs, and uh, municipal leaders uh, about a week ago, week and a half ago. 
and we discussed some of these questions. Uh, where we landed is that um, certain patient, certain guests um, of the mental health urgent care certainly can be brought in by law enforcement. Um, the way I'm reading the question, can law enforcement drop them off? Um, we would, we're encouraging all of the handoffs to the center and from the center to be warm handoffs. And so we'll continue to work with law enforcement on what that looks like. But law enforcement certainly could bring somebody who is uh, an appropriate guest candidate for the services at the mental health urgent care to the mental health urgent care to receive those services. That would be, that would certainly be acceptable. Okay. Um, and uh, the next question I think could go Maureen or Charlotte is about our catchment area. We have, the question is, will this serve certain parts of the state or will it be open to people from any area? And I think they mean in Vermont. Yeah, it's a great question. So if, if someone can physically get to our mental health urgent care program, we will welcome them. There's not a residency requirement. Like you don't have to be a Chittenden County resident, for example. There are certainly people who come to our community who find themselves in distress or in crisis, and we're very happy to serve them. That being said, many services or referrals that could likely help in that situation are in someone's home community. So we, in general, encourage people to access services as close to where they are as possible. The other mental health urgent care programs um, in our community right now are in the Northeast Kingdom, in Addison County, and Washington County. So those can certainly be accessed. There are mobile crisis response throughout Vermont, and there are a number of different peer support programs as well. So we, what we don't want is people driving three or four hours to come to mental health urgent care um, because likely there are immediate or emergent services in their community that they can access. But if someone's in the greater Burlington area and needs the service, they can absolutely come on in. We will provide support and then help make connections to ongoing services or care should they want that. Thank you. Um, Maureen, I think you addressed part of this question, uh, but this feels a little bit more nuanced than what you just spoke to. So um, the question is, um, could you speak to the coordination with law enforcement? And I know we talked about dropping off, but do you wanna speak to anything else related to that? I mean, I think we recognize the need, um, at, number one, the need related to uh, law enforcement and the fact that law, law enforcement is oftentimes our boots on the ground um, and interacting with individuals who might benefit from this program. And so we really want to have a close relationship and a, and a rapid response to how they're experiencing our program. We believe we know what uh, this is going to look like on October 28th and beyond. And I think we're probably about 60%, 75% right. And we're going to learn a lot. And so, um, as I mentioned, we had this uh, municipal leaders meeting uh, a week or so ago. Uh, I think we're going to need to do that three months in, six months in, and we're going to we're going to need to listen to our partners in law enforcement and in fire and ambulance to hear what's working really well and double down on that, and to also hear maybe what we didn't anticipate or what is not working well for them, and respond to those as well. So we hope it we hope it to have a very open dialogue with law enforcement, fire, and ambulance. Yes, thank you. Um, so then uh, this next one is for you, Charlotte. We've actually gotten a number of questions um, in the Q and A about uh, language access. So could you please speak to that in a general way about uh, both translations and interpretation? Yes, thank you. I'm really glad for the question because we want people to know that this program is for everyone and we want to make it as accessible as possible. We will have print materials translated into multiple languages and they will be available on Howard Center's website. Um, social media can um, help to um, ensure access to the program. And when someone arrives to the program and they're needing language interpretation, Howard Center has contracts with a number of local interpreters. And then we also have a contract with Language Line, um, which is a 24 seven service. So we can access it anytime as needed and have immediate um, phone or video um, interpretation. So um, people do not have to speak or read English to be able to access the service. We want everyone to come and we will help with the interpretation as needed. Okay. Um, 
So we've also gotten a few questions um, about this topic, and I'm appreciative of one of the um, questioners who uh, noted that today is Worldwide Suicide Prevention Day. And um, so the question is, can you describe uh, more the work being done to assist in prevention, destigmatization of mental health, um, and how centers like this can help prevent suicide um, in Vermont. And that dovetails with a number of questions that I've seen about suicide prevention in the program, so. This is a question I could probably spend the rest of our time talking about, so I'll get started. Um, suicide prevention is a particular passion of mine, and part of the interest in creating this program is really about suicide prevention. We want services to be destigmatized, and we want people to feel comfortable accessing services as soon as possible when they're ready to get help or they're feeling some sort of discomfort. And so the, I see the creation of this program really as a suicide prevention measure. We know through research that the number one reason people delay accessing help for any sort of mental health concern is stigma or fear of the reaction if they admit that they're struggling in a certain way. And so by having a warm and welcoming environment, by calling our patients or clients guests, by um, being at One Health Prospect Street, I really see that we can destigmatize mental health services as an effort towards suicide prevention. More specifically, the staff of mental health urgent care will be trained in suicide prevention. Um, every single staff from the administrative staff all the way through the program director um, will have or already has training in suicide prevention. Um, and the idea of providing high quality suicide care so that someone can feel comfortable or as comfortable as possible talking about their thoughts about suicide and help to figure out um, what the next step is in terms of a plan for their care. Our clinical supervisors and crisis clinicians will be specifically trained in a nationally recognized evidence-based model called CAMS, the Collaborative Assessment and Management of Suicidality. And this is a really beautiful assessment tool because it's collaborative. The model is that the crisis clinician literally sits next to shoulder to shoulder with a guest if they're comfortable with that, if that's what they want, and goes, goes through a worksheet together to talk about the drivers of the suicide crisis and what might help to alleviate stress or to help um, keep someone safe. And again, this is considered a national best practice in suicide care. And then um, in addition to this kind of assessment, we will have a number of different safety planning tools and options so that um, inpatient is one of a dozen different options, inpatient mental health treatment, a dozen different options that a guest can consider. Um, and on that kind of menu or array of options will be peer support, safety planning, use of natural supports, um, and then outpatient services, as well as follow-up care. And so we've really built this as a walk-in mental health urgent care, but by really providing and emphasizing follow-up care, we're hoping that that helps with suicide prevention as well. And lastly, I'll just say for this moment that we'll also have tools available to help with suicide care, including lock boxes and gun locks um, and different safety planning or coping skills um, apps or, um, or uh, tools. Um, so that someone's leaving with a number of um, a number of plans in place to help ensure their safety and to help provide that really specific targeted care. The one element I would add to that is the walk-in nature of the clinic itself will be um, assisting suicide prevention because when the individual is feeling desperate and like they have nowhere to go, they will now have somewhere to go that will receive them. And it's a beautiful space and trained individuals and um, they can start feeling well. Thank you, it's a great question. And thanks for noting what today is too. Uh, it's an important reminder about what we're working on here. Um, so we've actually gotten a couple of different questions uh, regarding turning point and recovery coaches. So I'm going to uh, turn to you, Maureen, um, just to give Charlotte a chance to, to breathe a little second. But um, so the question was about whether turning point is included in this partnership and um, uh, what we, what, what does it look like in terms of our coordination with recovery coaches? Sure. So um, the turning point center is not 
uh, officially a partner of this project, and I'll say yet, um, and not because they've you know signed up or they've offered resources, but because I can envision where this program will go in the next six months, year, three years, or five years. Uh, we know the incidence of co-occurring substance use and mental health uh, problems, and we recognize the amazing work that the Turning Point Center recovery coaches do in our emergency department today. Um, I actually recognize some names on uh, the, the guest list here. And we do want to replicate the services available to um, the guests that come to the mental health urgent care. And I think we need to sort of crawl before we walk. And so um, I, I do see a day where we would want to partner differently with the Turning Point Center on, on those services. Currently, um, as with I'll say all social services in uh, Chittenden County. Um, the Turning Point Center is and will be one of our referral services that uh, guests can access, certainly can access, and guests will be referred to um, as part of their treatment profile um, that is developed in the clinic. We would like um, all of our guests who have substance use, substance use disorders or are contemplating recovery um, to know that the Turning Point Center is there and to know about the fabulous work that the peer recovery coaches do, um, again, as I said, day to day, 24 seven in our emergency room and around the community. Okay. Um, we have a, no a number of questions about the level of service that CHC will be providing um, um, in, in the mental health urgent care. So Dr. McKee, we, we would welcome you to, to weigh in here. Um, but the questions are about um, uh, the nurse certification and how many there will be um, and what types of care they would be doing. In particular, we were asked whether or not a nurse would be able to do um, wound care. Um, but Charlotte and Maureen, if either one of you want to speak to it while Dr. McKee's coming on, I think we can we can we can answer this one together. Sure. Oh, Maureen, do you want to go, go ahead? ahead? Go ahead. Okay. We will have a registered nurse as part of the staff for mental health urgent care. Community Health Centers is hiring two part-time registered nurses to split the Monday through Friday week. They will be able to provide wound care. We are um, we are hoping that people will come to mental health urgent care for wound care when they need to before they would need emergency department level of care. Um, they will also be able to provide um, point of care testing, for example, pregnancy testing, um, chronic health concern management, like if someone needs help managing their diabetes, for example, that will be able to be provided as well. And then sometimes people are taking a number of medications um, and someone might be worried about symptoms or side effects. So um, understanding medications and what um, what some interactions may be, that kind of counseling will be available as well. Maureen, what would you add? Um, I would add that um, that is the front line of what is available in the urgent care and that CHC is making available um, some capacity in the event a guest needs further um, medical, medical clinical supports. And in addition, um, with regards to additional um, mental health supports, we have um, some capacity in the emergency department psychiatry team to help provide direction regarding um, ways that they can offer, um, I don't know, support and um, I guess medical direction for helping patients and guests not have to come to the emergency room. So um, if we uh, engage with the emergency psychiatry team at UVM um, emergency department, and they are able to say, based on what you're telling me, um, an increase of this or a decrease of that, or we know this uh, guest and we know that this intervention works well with them, um, that will be available to us as well. So the RN is the um, staff in the urgent care to start. And um, we, it is augmented, the, or the role is augmented with support from community health centers and from the UVM emergency psychiatry team. Okay, um, thank you. And if Dr. McKee, if you wanted to come off camera and add anything to that, we would 
we would welcome we would welcome you. Uh, uh, thanks, Karen. Um, I, my camera, I can't turn it on for some reason, but uh, oh. just, to, just to clarify that uh, um, the on-site uh, staffing will be through an RN, but we do have uh, uh, primary care uh, nurse practitioner or physician time reserved to support the program for its entire um, period of operation. So we'll make sure that those services are available through telehealth through uh, for a primary care connection. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Dr. McKee. So I'll know next time if we have a question for you that I'll just I'll just put it your way um, and not wait for you to come on camera. So um, I think uh, either one of you could answer this next question, Maureen or Charlotte. Um, uh, and actually, I think this really speaks to how this partnership is going to work. We were asked about documentation and specifically we were asked about documentation of visits in EPIC, which is the um, electronic medical record that UVM Health Network uses and Howard and Community Health Center has used different platforms. Pathways has its own platform. So would either one of you be willing to speak to how this part of things will work? I'll start off and um, very clearly state that there will be no documentation of this in the EPIC um, in, uh, electronic health record. This is not a UVM Medical Center clinical operation. It is not staffed by UVM Medical Center um, employees, and therefore we do not have a business need to access um, or to document uh, the care in our record. We will rely on the Howard Center um, CHC and Pathways documentation in the same way that we would rely on a private practice um, documentation system to communicate to us um, if there is a, a patient or a guest that is that we are part of their care team. And so um, if there are patients and guests of the uh, mental health urgent care that we share, and I, we know there will be, or we know there are, um, then we will rely on them feeding us whatever clinical information is appropriate for us to receive. Thanks, okay. Maureen. Oh, I'll just add that um, each partner agency, so Howard Center, Pathways, and Community Health Centers will be maintaining their own documentation in their own record, but we don't want a guest to have to repeat their story and we want their care to be coordinated. So when a guest arrives in the program, they'll explain the services that can be offered and a staff member will help review a consent form that it, um, again explains these services and the guest at that point will decide what services they're looking for and uh, what communication is allowed between the partners so that, um, so that communication can happen. And if, for example, someone calls first call the evening that they access mental health urgent care, if the guest consented to um, Howard Center being involved in their care, um, first call clinicians as part of Howard Center would be able to see the services provided for mental health urgent care so that there can be coordination and continuity. Okay, great. Um, and for this next question, I think uh, Maureen, Charlotte, either one of you could answer this, but I'm also wondering if Katie Bork from uh, Pathways wouldn't mind also weighing in. So the question is, um, how will you manage time with guests against not keeping people waiting? And so I wonder if you could bring to life a little bit for everybody participating in the town hall, what it's gonna feel like and be like in the clinic. Katie, if you wanna join and talk a little bit about the vision for peer support services, that would be wonderful. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. I'm happy to speak to this. So we'll have three staff from Pathways Vermont with lived experience of mental health or substance use challenges that will be providing peer support services. And we actually have a designated area at the Mental Health Urgent Care to be providing these services. Um, so we're thinking we'll probably have up to four to five people at a given time in that space. And we also have a really nice waiting area. Um, so I think people will probably be going between those two um, like spaces while they're waiting to possibly meet with the clinicians. Um, and just to say one of the things I think we're excited about with this project too, is that folks can opt into only receiving peer services if they want. Um, we're coming from a very choice-based perspective and, um, you know, the peers will be available to join those clinical meetings as well. And we also are excited to refer to all of our other uh, peer services in the community. 
Um, thank you, Katie. Did you want to say anything else about um, some of the services that might be available or you want me to pump the question to Um, these guys? sure. You mean like some of the community services? Yeah, Uh, well, sure. I was wondering if it's about some of the respite options too. Yeah, so I, our hope is that we'll, we're will we actually going to be opening a peer respite in Chittenden County, um, hopefully within the next like two months. So we'll be referring folks there. I'm also supporting with the Soteria Vermont program. So we're hoping to refer folks to that program as well. We also have the Vermont support line, which is 24 seven. And in Chittenden County, we also have the Pathways Vermont Community Center. So all of these are peer-based services that we'll be able to refer folks to. Um, another exciting thing is that all of the staff at the mental health urgent care are going to be trained in intentional peer support. And that's the foundational training that Pathways uses for all of our direct service staff that are already providing peer support. So we're really excited about that as well. Yeah, and we are too. Um, and as, as you all may have gotten, Pathways um, has consistently led us in this process of ensuring that we are centering the experiences of community members who will be availing themselves of this of this mental health urgent care. So thank you, Katie. And I think also for those of you who are asking questions, so wait, what happens at 445? What happens at five? Um, you know, we have addressed that in terms of how the mental health urgent care will operate. But I also think it's important to note the important role that Pathways plays in our um, in our in our system of care, if you will, um, and supports uh, for the community. So um, thank you, Katie. Um, OK. Um, oh, goodness. I, I did. I hadn't seen it. The next question. I'm so sorry. So just I just need one second. Um, Okay, so we're getting questions. Uh, there are a few of these actually about how do we coordinate, um, uh, you know, with other providers. So obviously, we've been sharing that this is uh, a drop-in um, location for folks, but I think people are also curious, like respecting that we don't need advanced coordination or referral. But for clinicians who are working at other agencies, I'm getting the sense that they would like to be able to coordinate with us. Um, and so Maureen or Charlotte, would either one of you speak to your thoughts about um, how we might do that and how somebody might be able to reach out to us so that we can think about this maybe sooner rather than later? Absolutely. So um, like uh, we've talked about, and like Karen just said again, if someone is in distress or needing support, they can walk right in. But that same person, a family member or a provider, whether it's a, a primary care doctor or a therapist or another uh, member of our provider community can accompany someone to mental health urgent care if that feels right and appropriate. And then it can also call mental health urgent care between the hours of nine to five to ask questions about the wait time if there is one, or um, to connect to clinical support for consultation. If someone's not sure if mental health urgent care should be part of someone's crisis or support plan, I'll say here that it probably should be, but we're happy to talk specifics about a particular person, assuming proper consents are in place so that we can share information and um, how mental health urgent care can best support them. It may be that a therapist or provider or other support person has some critical information that they want to share provider to provider about a guest who's coming to the program. And we can absolutely take those calls and be a listening ear and receive information to help inform the care options that we present um, to a guest. On the other side, after we provide our services, if a guest has consented to follow up care, um, any sort of provider, it could be a family member or natural support, or again, some other support service, maybe getting a follow-up call or a consultation call so that we can put our heads together to talk about what referrals may be appropriate, what a safety plan could look like, or what follow-up care might be. And that call may be with the guest. That would be certainly ideal, or it may be after those services, again, if proper consents are in place so that we can coordinate care back and forth to ensure a seamless experience um, and that um, all the people who are informed about the care and the plan who should be based on the guest preferences are informed. Okay, cool. Thank you. I hadn't muted myself, so I hadn't realized that. Um, 
So this is a great question, and we do talk about this quite a bit. It's really related to the health-related social needs, um, is that kind of how I would encapsulate it. Um, but are there discussions about the integration of mental health issues, um, trauma, homelessness, and substance abuse? Absolutely. I don't think we can talk about one without talking about the others. This will be driven by the stated needs and the goals of guests who come in. All the staff in the program will be trained in mental providing mental health care and an overview of our local system of care, trained in understanding co-occurring needs, whether it's mental health and substance use, um, an intellectual disability, um, a medical concern, and the intersection of those concerns um, and certainly understanding our the needs of our houseless population and some of the driving factors and then what resources are available. And so staff will have fundamental background information in this and be uh, fully versed in the resources in our community. And there will be ongoing opportunities for staff to be trained. And then also information for guests if there's a new service in town um, a particular clinic or opportunity for services that is new or different and informational cards from our partner agencies across the community, across sectors available for our guests so that they can choose the services they want to access and we can help them figure out how to do that. Okay, great. This next question could be for Charlotte or Katie. Um, it's which partner will be employing those who will be checking in guests? I'll start, and then Katie, if you want to add anything, um, please do. So when a guest arrives to the program, um, the reception area will be staffed by Howard Center staff. There will be administrative assistance that can help with kind of that traditional check-in. There will also be um, a navigator. But as Katie mentioned earlier, if someone wants to go right to peer support as their first point of contact, that will absolutely be an option as well. Katie, do you want to say any more? I think that was well said. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so for people just seeking ongoing medication prescriptions, um, would this be an appropriate place to suggest for them? And they were using some examples of anxiety medication or ADHD, et cetera. That's a, a great question. So the intention of this program is to provide urgent care or crisis supports and not to be providing ongoing care. It's one of the beauties of the partnership with community health centers. Someone might come because they're new to the community and not have um, a primary care doctor or they may be in some sort of crisis with their medications. They can absolutely come and through the support from the registered nurse and community health centers, they can be connected to an ongoing primary care doctor. If someone doesn't want primary care, specifically at community health centers, our care managers can help them connect to another primary care provider in our community. But the intention and purpose is that we're connecting um, people to ongoing care across different types of needs. So if someone's coming, um, um, in a repeated way for case management services, we would look at what the needs are and help them connect to an ongoing case manager. Um, or if they're needing ongoing support related to depression, for example, we would help connect them to a therapist in the community. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Maureen, I believe this might want, this one might be for you. Um, um, if someone is trespassed from UVM Medical Center um, uh, properties, could they be served by your program? Yes, they could. Um, this is not a UVM Medical Center clinical operation. Um, and so if somebody was trespass trespassed uh, from another UVM or from a UVM Medical Center clinic um, or other clinical setting, um, that legally would be a separate trespass um, issue than the Howard Center CHC Pathways Mental Health Urgent Care. Okay, thank you. And also just wanted to say how much I'm appreciating seeing the love in the Q&A and how many of you are expressing excitement about this program. So thank you for that. Um, so um, 
the next question is actually about whether or not folks may come back to uh, the mental health urgent care. Charlotte, this feels like it might be for you. <laughs> I'm happy to take this one. So not only can people come back, but they're encouraged to come back. We know that um, talking to a crisis clinician for a couple hours or a care manager um, helping to make some connections to other services will likely not alleviate the whole crisis or symptoms that led someone to come to mental health urgent care to begin with. So we will be offering and encouraging follow-up services. And that could be that someone comes in the morning and receives some services and then comes back later in the day or comes back the next day or a few days later or a week later. Um, we will help connect them to ongoing supports in the community from that very first visit. So no one's required to come back. But if someone um, wants to come back and that's helpful in their time of crisis, that is absolutely welcome. Thank you. Um, this next question, I actually feel like any of the partners um, could address, um, but I'm gonna put this to you two first. Um, but if any of our other panelists wanna weigh in, please feel free to um, go off camera or send a note that you would like to come off camera because I think we're having some issues with that. So this is actually regarding health equity. So how are we accommodating the unique mental health challenges of the Black community during this national mental health crisis? So I think that that's a question that really goes to us all. Would either one of you like to speak to it first? I'm happy to start. So I think one start for this answer is about awareness and training for staff. So at this point in our process of developing this program, we're working on a training calendar. And in the very first week of training, um, there's training for staff on um, unconscious bias and cultural awareness, cultural humility. Um, there will be training on um, um, using language line and using interpreter access and awareness of um, initiatives in our community that are promoting health equity and fighting racism. So that awareness and staff training doesn't certainly doesn't fully answer the question, but as one start um, that will be part of the core foundation for this program. I think we'll also have to um, make sure that opening the door on the first day is, is not the end of um, our outreach to the black community and to other uh, marginalized communities. Uh, within Chittenden County. Uh, we'll have to respond to uh, what they tell us that is needed and uh, feels welcoming. Um, and if that um, means that we have to pivot in three months or six months to make an operational change that will make the environment or the staff more ready to serve this population, um, then, then we will. This, this is, I believe, an iterative process. Um, and I think there are some things we can learn from um, that we have offered and have worked and that we have offered and may not have worked, um, but it's gonna be a continual, continuous improvement project. The Thank other you. thing I'll add is that um, we are attracting staff for the various positions we have who are very excited about this partnership and very excited to be part of filling this gap in our community. And we're not ready to share um, names or titles of our new staff, we'll certainly, um, be able to do that in late October, but we are recruiting and hiring an incredibly diverse staff, not only a number of people, a number of people from the global majority, but also people with lived experience of their own mental health challenges, who are very open about their recovery stories, who identify as veterans, um, who have family members who have access similar services. And our hope is that by continuing to recruit and hire staff from different backgrounds, we'll best be able to serve the um, the unique uh, populations in our community. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't know if this question, I think there was a question about whether uh, we could speak to more of the peer services that have been provided and uh, that will be provided. And I think Katie did a nice overview for that. So if that attendee still has questions, please just put another question in there. Um, and then um, we are still getting some questions about um, insurance. And I know we've addressed that, but it just, 
it just bears re repeating if um, either one of you wouldn't mind speaking to it um, uh, regarding guests who um, do not have insurance. Um, it says for guests who do not have, who do have insurance, wouldn't it make sense to bill insurance um, to start covering costs? Thoughts on that? Yeah, that's a great question. So one day down the road, we will be billing insurance for this program. But to start, we are not billing insurance because we don't want there to be any barriers to accessing mental health support. Some people have very large co-pays that are deterrent to accessing help. Some people have very large deductible plans that's increasingly common in our community. And that can serve as a barrier or a deterrent to accessing treatment. We want everyone who is needing emergent mental health support regardless of whether or not they've accessed services before or they've been in, in crisis before to be comfortable accessing this program should they need to do so. And we don't want insurance, insurance to be yet another barrier um, to accessing our care. So to start a decision was made not to access insurance to help increase accessibility, promote equity, um, and then again, uh, do this kind of behind the scenes study of what money insurance would bring in and what different plans people have what and what partnerships and creativity and innovation we can think of to help make this sustainable moving forward. Thank you. Um, we've gotten a few questions about security um, and what security will be um, available on uh, at the site itself. Maureen, do you want to talk about security for the campus and then I'll talk about the plans for the program? Sure. Um, uh, the One South Pro Prospects Street building um, houses UVM Medical Center clinical operations in a various uh, couple of different clinic settings. It also houses some UVM university, not medical center, but just university um, functions. Um, the universe, UVM Medical Center uh, has a um, security guard um, in the guard shack uh, business hours and um, there is a response for UVM Medical Center clinical uh, need, clinical site need um, from the main campus security team. Because this is not a UVM Medical Center clinical operation, um, the project has um, taken responsibility for uh, the needs, the security needs of the population within the staffing model. And the, the um, we, I've learned, I, I think everybody has, but I certainly have learned a lot from Lindsay and Katie at Pathways around what a security response might look like with this population um, that might be different from what we've seen in other settings. And as such, instead of calling people security and having badges and, and looking like a, a police presence or a security presence, um, we are uh, approaching this with a different um, uh, de-escalation stance where our um, guest behavior management um, and behavior de-escalation is going to be handled through our navigators. Um, it's an attempt to lower the temperature, so to speak, on confrontation and, um, and handle situations in a different way. Um, I did see a, a question in the uh, Q&A around um, not having enough of a security response. Um, and it, it's not the same security response that you would see in an either main campus um, UVM Medical Center setting or a um, uh, you know emergency department setting, certainly, but it is a different response. So, so it's not quite an apples to apples comparison. Um, we have uh, full faith in the navigators um, and the navigator model, and um, and we and we and we do believe that is enough of a behavior management um, structure in place. One South Prospect Street is also a, um, a property in the city of Burlington um, and adjacent to the UVM campus. Um, if there were an, an incident that required a police response that that is certainly available although we believe the need to escalate to that level will be few and far between in running numbers so currently uh, one south prospect street houses um, the iop intensive outpatient program and php partial hospital program 
Uh, it also houses our addiction treatment program. Um, these, um, and we call them patients at UVM Medical Center. These patients, the patients of these programs um, are uh, have pretty significant acute illness that we're treating. Um, and I can tell you in the last two years, uh, there have been exactly zero um, what we call code eight or, or um, uh, met, uh, uh, behavior responses um, to the One South Prospect Street campus. Um, the guests of the mental health urgent care probably are some of the similar, profi similar profiles of the patients we treat in the Seneca program. Um, and the biggest difference is that the guests accessing the mental health urgent care need care today and may not be in a place to uh, wait for a program to start or to engage in a full program. And so um, we feel very confident in the level of um, safety that's being provided for this program. Thanks, Maureen. Okay. I'll just add that, again, in the very first week of training, the staff will be taking um, a trauma-informed de-escalation training, again, for all staff, and then other trainings that promote uh, verbal communication. This is a completely hands-off model. And um, and we while we will have navigators specifically helping with safety protocols and to ensure a safe and trauma-informed environment for all, all of the staff in the program will be trained in de-escalation and trauma-informed supports. Okay, I'm scanning. <laughs> um, so uh, one question that we haven't spoken to specifically with respect to um, coordination with others is whether or not another mental health clinician could contact the mental health urgent care for a consult. Yes, if someone is concerned about their patient or client, and again, there's proper consent in place to share information, they can absolutely call to talk about what services mental health urgent care can provide or um, what we can do to help. And particularly that feels purposeful. So the um, person coming for services, so the guest doesn't have to repeat their story if they don't want to, and so that their care is as coordinated as possible. We can't take the place of good clinical supervision or consultation um, within a, a particular agency um, or system, so to speak. But if someone's curious about accessing mental health urgent care or not sure of direct steps for the person they're working with, they can absolutely call. Thank you. And as you all presented um, early um, in our time together, this is not the first center of its kind, that this is based off of an existing model. And so we have a question in here about um, uh, just looking for confirmation that there are more centers like this opening or have opened in other areas of the state. Yes, so this is the fourth mental health urgent care in Vermont. Each has a different name, but right now there's a program called Front Porch in Northeast Kingdom. There's a program in Addison County and also a program in Washington County. All are unique in terms of the hours of operation, how they're staffed and the services that are provided. But across the state, there's an effort to make sure that there's a place for people to go who are in distress or needing mental health care besides or instead of the emergency department whenever that's appropriate. And this model of mental health urgent care exists across the country and is becoming more common. And so very early in our, our process, we did research on a number of different national models um, and, went, and went to visit one in New York that was the basis of um, how this program looks and was created. Thank you. So um, this is a question that we have uh, we have heard a, a few times, and I always feel like this is a good thing for us to clarify. Um, so um, it's about whether or not somebody can come to the mental health urgent care because they actually need support with wound care um, or something along those lines, um, but don't have a mental health crisis. So a lot of the wound care needs in our community might be based on substance use or might be based on other 
um, social determinants of health sorts of needs where someone might not have a mental health crisis exactly, but they might be worried or concerned about going to the emergency department or accessing other types of medical treatment for their wound. And we absolutely want them to come to mental health urgent care for wound treatment. The registered nurse from community health centers will talk about options for ongoing care so that someone doesn't have to come back repeatedly for wound care. But we really do want people um, that need wound care to access the service, and then we can help them with other supports um, for the future. And we acknowledge that when we add a resource like this to the system, um, we need to give some time for the system to catch up or for the system to get smarter. And so if there are guests that um, access the mental health urgent care where there may have been a different resource that was appropriate or um, might have served them differently or better, um, we will help them and we will share with them the other resources available in the community. And so um, this is partially about um, opening our doors to a population in need and partially about helping the system get smarter. Okay, last question, y'all. Um, and this is a fun one. Uh, we got a question about whether or not we could use volunteer help and whether we take donations. That's a wonderful question. So um, we can't um, physically have volunteers in the program the first day, but Howard Center and the partner op agencies have different opportunities for volunteers. And the best way to um, know more about that is by going to either Howard Center's website or one of the partner agencies' websites regarding volunteer opportunities that typically happen at different intervals throughout the year. In terms of donations specifically earmarked to mental health urgent care, Howard Center welcomes those as does the partner agencies. And we will make sure um, that specific donations for this program are directed in the right place. Thank you for that generous question. I love that too. Okay, well, I'm gonna get, a, I'm gonna bring us on home. And there were actually a few questions in the Q and A that I'm about to address for those of you who are sitting on the edges of your seats. So um, first of all, thank you all to our participants. Um, uh, at one point we had 270 people on this call. And for those of you who are still with us, um, we just so appreciate your interest um, in this program and your really great and thoughtful questions today. Obviously we could not get to all of your really excellent questions, but I hope that today has provided you all a lot more information um, so that you know where to go. So, um, I also just wanted to say a huge thank you to Maureen and Charlotte. You two were in the hot seat for almost this whole time. And um, thank you for your presentation and for handling the questions. And also thank you to Dr. McKee, Dr. Altoff, and Katie for also weighing in on questions and our other panelists who were on the ready in case a question came for them. So thank you all for being a part of this. Um, and Jen and Lu Lucia, you both have been amazing as interpreters. So thank you for that. So as you can see up on the screen here, somebody asked whether or not there would be an opportunity for people to see the space before it opens. And so I'm happy to share that we will be having um, a public ribbon cutting on October 21st from three to seven, and you are welcome to drop in. Um, I also wanted to share with you all that today's recording will be available um, in a few days at howardcenter.org. And um, early in the session, some of you asked whether or not um, we would be able to share with you some of our outreach materials. And I was informed by one of my colleagues who actually kicked off the hour with us is that we can actually send our FAQ, um, sorry, our, our frequently asked questions as well as our information sheet to everybody who registered um, for this webinar. So please stay tuned. And then finally, um, for those of you who either want to see uh, this and have more questions answered and or um, pass this along to your colleagues, we will be holding a second uh, virtual town hall on October 16th from 6 to 7.30, and you can register at howardcenter.org, and I imagine you will be seeing some email invites about that um, uh, very, very soon. So thank you again, everyone, for your participation and for being with us today.